Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Radnor Memorial Library. Thank you all for coming. My name is Pam Sador, and many thanks to Radnor Historical Society, our co-sponsor for this evening's author event. This is a great crowd. I am not surprised. <laughs> and Tom Ellis, thank you for covering us with Radnor Historical Society. Vince from Studio 21, also great to see you again. Okay. Um, and it's special. This is a special author event. It's special because we are Elizabeth Mosier's hometown library. <laughs> and we are thrilled. <laughs> we are thrilled to celebrate the publication of Elizabeth's new book, Excavating Memory. Excavating Memory, Archaeology, and Home. Literally right off the press, right? Yeah. Over the years, I've shared many evenings in the Windsor Room with Libby, her husband Chris Mills, and even our daughters Allison and Catherine. How wonderful it has been to have their support here at Radnor Memorial Library. I'd like to thank Nick, as I did, from Main Point, uh, no, Nick, there you are. <laughs> Nick, Main Point Books, and also our official bookseller this evening for excavating memory. I'll tell you about Elizabeth. Elizabeth Mosier logged 1,000 volunteer hours processing colonial era artifacts at Philadelphia's Independence National <coughs> Historical Park Archaeology Lab Laboratory to write excavating memory, archaeology and home, which uses archaeology as a framework to explore personal material including her mother's memory loss, the layering of shared experience in creating family or community narratives, and the role that artifacts play in historical memory. Elizabeth is a novelist, essayist, and has twice been named a Discipline Winner Fellowship finalist by the Pew Fellowships of the Arts, and has recently, you know, has received fellowships from Yaddo, the Belay Col Colony for the Arts, Vermont Studio Center, and the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. Her nonfiction has been selected as notable in Best American Essays and appears most recently in Cleaver, Creative Nonfiction, and the Philadelphia Inquirer, which is where I always read Libby. <laughs> and she writes the Intersections column on alumni lives for the Bryn Mawr Alumni Bulletin. So please welcome Elizabeth Mosier. I need my voice. <laughs> Gosh, thank you so much for coming. Um, before I start, I, I just wanted to acknowledge that two of my Inquirer editors are here, Avery Rome and Kevin Ferris. And um, I really mean it when I say uh, there are several essays in this collection that wouldn't have been written if they hadn't given me deadlines um, and, and hadn't been equally nerdy um, as I am and interested in, in Philadelphia history. So thank you for that. Um, I am fascinated by how the artifacts that form the archaeological record constitute and in some cases correct the stories we tell about ourselves and how we live. Um, and as a volunteer technician at the Independence National Historical Park La Archaeology Laboratory, which rolls off your tongue after you say it a few million times, <laughs> I got to practice looking closely at small things. And beneath the city, I knew mostly by its buildings and monuments and celebrated citizens. After a thousand hours in the lab, I viewed my own material through this new lens. So what I wanted to talk about tonight, um, I hope will be interesting to people who are the family archivists um, and genealogists, but also the writers in the room, because there are many of you. Um, it's my idea that artists and archeologists process loss, whether it's personal loss or local loss or national loss by making meaning which is the artifact of experience. Um, and, and I think why this is important to me is because this process in the archaeology lab was a circuitous process of self-discovery. Um, and I discovered that um, meaning seeking gave me a kind of momentum. Um, and I think that is always true for us when we're trying to reconnect our, our lost history um, and to thereby heal that, those divisions that we feel. Um, 
And I guess we should turn off the lights. It's a little easier to see my gigantic face. Um, I included this picture because it, it uh, reminds me to tell you that I worked at the lab for seven years every Thursday. Um, sometimes I would teach my class, then put jeans on in the bathroom and, and get on the train to go downtown. Um, and during this time, I was flying back and forth between Phoenix and Philadelphia. Um, and this is one particular day that I had taken a red eye back from Phoenix where I was dealing with some crises um, that had to do with my mother's memory loss. Um, and it's just to tell you that's why I look so tired. Um, but also, I took this job very seriously. I, I signed up for the job. I wasn't there to write about it. I actually wanted to be part of the project um, because I found it so interesting and I learned so much. And I thought just to give you a sense of um, what the, how the book is framed, I would just read the first two paragraphs from the first essay that four years in to this project I wrote for the, the magazine called Creative Nonfiction. It was called The Pit and the Page. When I talk about my volunteer work at the Independence National Park Archaeology Laboratory in Philadelphia, people often ask me if I've taken anything. <laughs> Apparently, many people would pocket a shirt of broken glass or pottery as a souvenir if given half a chance. But these fragments of colonial history don't tempt me. They seem sacred, imbued with other people's stories. Besides, there are too many pieces for any one piece to be precious. I only have to enter the lab's storeroom and stand amid the floor-to-ceiling rows of cartons, more than a million artifacts hauled up from a mile-square block of backyard privy pits to feel the weight of history. Two sites, one named for the President's House that once stood at 6th and Market, the other for the National Constitution Center that now stands on the vast lawn across the street, have yielded more treasures than the dig at Colonial Williamsburg. It will take 10 years to process it all. Today's assignment, brushing diluted adhesive across tiny field specimen numbers to seal the numbers inked onto hundreds of sherds, is zen-like in its tedium. <laughs> Hours pass, marked by the transfer of pieces one by one, from mesh tray to aluminum, as the empty baker's rack is slowly filled. My time to think, I tell my friends. But really, I love the work because it requires just enough focus so that I can't think. I can't think about my mother, who is dying slowly and furiously. My grief is an unpacked box of sharp pieces stacked in a dark storeroom while I lug around a catalog of unfinished business. This is my break from that. This is a picture, if you know um, Sixth and Market, you can see Independence Hall in the background. So this is the corner where the President's House dig um, was going on, and this was taken in 2000, <coughs> or I'm sorry, 2007. When I visited the dig with my daughters, right after um, they, they had been digging for a while and they uncovered the uh, what was described later as the architectural precedent to the Oval Office. It was a bow window, um, and you could see half of the outline in the ground, in the foundation, that Washington had actually added to the house that stood there, um, that he occupied while Philadelphia was the capital. So that detail added by Washington meant to be a symbol of democracy, meeting the public at their level and not on a throne like a king juxtaposed with five feet away, the quarters where his slaves, um, or the kitchen where one of his enslaved uh, Africans was cooking his meals, um, was what really drew me to uh, the project. Um, the opportunity to, tell, to help tell the stories of the slaves who lived in this house that was Washington's um, was really something a writer can't resist. Um, so that's what initially made me go downtown and take a look. I brought my daughters who were little, I think they were in middle school at the time, um, but what really made me want to sign up for the project was Jed Levin, who is the head archaeologist on the, the project, stood in the pit in his hard hat for like 45 minutes and answered all of our questions in the <laughs> noonday sun while sweating. And I really just thought, I want to hang out with people like this um, who are so into what they're doing um, and, and happy to talk about it at length. 
Um, and that day he told me the story of the, there was a lot of pressure on this dig because they had been, I think, digging for, they, the reason they, they did it in the first place is the Liberty Bell, as if you remember, it was in the middle of Independence Mall, and they moved it to the edge. So they had to do a dig. Um, there was a lot riding on this. Um, there was a lot of money, it was time that wasn't um, being used to build the National Constitution Center and the new Liberty Bell Pavilion. Um, so Jed felt a lot of pressure and they'd been digging for five weeks and they'd found nothing. Um, until one day he found a penny from 1833 um, and he told me that was an omen. Um, I didn't know that, but it was a, that's a tradition that Masons put a penny in the floor that they're laying. So that's how Jed knew that they were about to break through into colonial Philadelphia and that the, the, uh, the dig had, that they had done to build Independence Mall in the 50s had not destroyed all of, this, um, all of these foundations as they feared. Um, so uh, when he told me that story, I could, I could recognize the career-making moment that that was for him. Um, but also, it was the way Jed talked about it that really excited me. He said, this foundation isn't just bricks and mortar. It's a tangible link to the people who lived in this house and a link between the enslaved and the free. Um, and obviously, as a writer, that um, just resonated with me. The idea of telling an old untold story, digging for the truth, um, and those of you who've lived in Philadelphia, we'd, everyone had sort of forgotten that this house was Washington's. It, it was a ladies' restroom for a while in the 50s. <laughs> By the time I got to college in the 80s, there was just, it was just pavement. So it literally had been lost. Um, so from the very beginning, this project was a project of recovery and repair. Um, the lost architectural link, that bow window that became the Oval Office in Washington, D.C., when the Capitol was moved, the lost building that no one in Philadelphia could tell you where it was um, or who had lived there. And then the part that was most resonant for me were the untold stories of those nine enslaved Africans who lived on that site. <coughs> and as the, as the President's House Memorial was being built, and here's a schematic model of it <laughs> with happy people walking around, um, it was very apparent the layering of history and the way in which people's versions enter into the final record. Um, there were, the, Joanne, you'll remember this, it was a big deal in Philadelphia, a lot of discussions um, that involved archaeologists, city leaders, um, a group called Avenging the Ancestors Coalition who were determined to make sure that the story was told and told the right way. Um, that it wasn't just glossed over um, in the signage that, um, with which we tell visitors about Independence Park. Um, the writer Laureen Carey was involved in, you can, I don't know if you, you can see it in the uh, picture I'll show you later, but there are video monitors inside this house that um, they hired actors to portray the nine enslaved Africans who lived there, and Laureen Carey wrote the script. Um, and just because I know her, she's a fiction writer, but she told me that she was really determined that if there was one fact that was known about a person, they would just use that fact. She was, as a fiction writer, <laughs> she appreciates the difference between making things up and, and actually sticking to the record. So those scripts that she wrote are based on fact, um, what, what was found in the ground. Um, and that, when, to this process of talking about how the memorial would be built made me think a lot about um, how artifacts, as I said, constitute and correct the stories we tell about ourselves. And in the process of telling this story about President Washington, about the nine enslaved Africans who lived there, um, property maps and city directories revealed some surprising economic, cultural, and racial diversity of the block. Um, I think people had an idea of Philadelphia as being more segregated, but in that same neighborhood, doctors, wealthy merchants, bricklayers, shoemakers, laborers, Quakers, free and enslaved Africans, French and German immigrants all lived next door to each other. And right across the street from the president's house um, was uh, a man named James Orinoco Dexter, um, who was an enslaved coachman who bought his own freedom and lived on the block from 1790 to 98. Um, he helped establish the Free African Society with two leading figures of the independent black, black church movement, Richard Allen and Ab Absalon Jones. 
Um, and he hosted meetings in his house to establish the St. Thomas African Episcopal Church. But his name was lost to history until this one document here on the bottom. Um, that's actually the record of a coffin maker um, who has made a coffin for Orinoco James Dexter um, made of walnut with handles. Um, that's the only record that we have of a man who was really important. Um, and Jed Levin, who is the man up in the right-hand corner, is my hero because in addition to telling the story of the nine enslaved Africans who lived at Washington's house, every time I've heard him speak, he tells the story of James Dexter. He's determined to make sure that that story is known, um, and it wouldn't be known because even the churches didn't have records of James Dexter. So sometimes the only record of history is in the ground, and that really impressed me. But the dig became important to me for personal reasons, too. Um, the seven years that I spent at the lab coincided with my mother's mental decline due to Alzheimer's disease. So as I, this is a picture of her in high school. That's a picture of her about two years before she died um, in her memory care center in Phoenix. Um, and as I was working at the lab, as I said, I wasn't there to write about it. Um, but as I was working at the lab, I started over that long period of time to see connections between the work that archeologists do and the work I was doing, which was digging and processing and repairing. Um, so I came to see archaeology as a bit like grieving. Later, I started to see connections between archaeology and writing. And um, one of the comparisons I make in the essay, The Pit and the Page, is writing is like repairing a broken bottle from the base up and then taking it apart again to fashion a story from what you've found. This is just a, sort of some pictures of what we did there. Um, I loved the tedium of this, um, and I'm always careful to say I'm not an archaeologist. I, I had no training for this job other than what the archaeologists were generous enough to give me. Um, and after seven years, I learned a lot because they were patient and answered questions and showed me how to, to do the technician job that I was doing. Um, as I joke, the only skills I brought to this were nearsightedness and patience. Um, I'm pretty patient. Um, and I was quite relieved as I was working um, on these different tasks. The, I, I like to think of the top left picture, I call that one some party. Um, that's just broken glass that one of my jobs was to wash it and put it in drying racks. Um, in the middle, those are sherds that I, because I'm nearsighted, I was good at putting tiny little numbers on those tiny little pieces. Some of them are as big as your pinky nail. Um, and the bottom is repairing. So we would put together broken vessels, broken bottles, really just with scotch tape. And then, as I said, we'd take them apart again and count the pieces and log them. Um, because the point really was to find out how many bottles were in the privy pit. How many plates? Was it a full set? Um, it wasn't really about displaying those, those objects. <clears throat> that was a revelation to me. The first thing I learned that was really important is that ar archaeology, especially urban archaeology, is ethnography. For some reason, I thought it was about putting things in museums with labels and cleaning them up and fixing them up. Um, but the archaeologists quickly dissuaded me of that notion that it was really about not the thing that we were <laughs> repairing, but the people who used the thing. And that was a revelation to me. <clears throat> that the treasure isn't the artifact, but what we can learn about the people who used it from the artifact. Um, so washing, labeling, mending, and cataloging a colonial neighborhood's glass fragments and ceramic sherds trained me to start to see broken, discarded things as evidence, which is not the way I'd thought before. Evidence of social class, consumer patterns, cultural practices, politics, and relationships. Um, so I started to see <laughs> what was under the ground is the real story, and what was on top of the ground is maybe not the whole story. Um, and I started to get a, a strong sense that we, that I think most writers can relate to, that we construct reality, and we create history, and we do it from pieces that we've saved either by choice or just by accident. Um, and a thousand hours at the lab was enough time to practice that skill so that I began to view my own material through a different lens. <clears throat>
Um, so as I said, I didn't intend to write about it, but after four years, I started to write about it. Um, I sort of couldn't help myself. Um, and in that time, because of situation with my mother and the need to sell my family childhood home to pay for memory care, um, and also the decline of my in-laws, um, my husband and I emptied four houses full of objects collected by our parents. Um, and we're sort of the go-to people for that kind of work. Um, so I was thinking about a lot about why we keep what we keep and we throw other things away. Because I had to make decisions. My family lives in Phoenix, I live here, I couldn't take everything back. My mother had 6,000 books, um, which I had to dispense with. I couldn't bring them all home and that was probably one of the most heartbreaking tasks because it was her life collection. Um, but I had to make, I had to, to deal with it somehow and I found that I, I was putting on an archaeologist's hat and thinking, what would Jed Levin do with this <laughs> pile of, of material? Um, but also, there's a way in which, for me, the decision, I know Marie Kondo talks about sparking joy and <laughs> I've, I haven't read her work but everyone tells me about it. Um, um, but for me, that decision about keeping something versus letting it go, is really guided by a familiar visceral feeling that I get when I write. I have this strong feeling, this is something I can use. And for me that means I can write about it. <clears throat> it will help me to make meaning in some way. So that is by way of explaining why the Farmer's Guide Cookbook <laughs> is one of the few artifacts that I came back with from Phoenix. I had to get rid of a lot of things, but this is something I could use. Um, if you're writing family history, um, the first step is always connecting these invaluable primary sources. They, it might be ephemera or diaries or documents or artifacts to the person. Um, and this cookbook connected me to my family. It was my mother's mother's. Um, it comes from, it was published in 1927. Um, the picture down in the lower right is my grandmother and my great-grandmother in the Indiana kitchen where she used it. Mm -hmm. So I know that cookbook was in that room. That explains all the grease splatters <laughs> all over it. Um, and it was valuable to me for that reason. Um, and often when I'm talking to, peop to writers about how to use artifacts, um, I employ a strategy that I learned at the lab, which is to create an artifact tag for the object first. Some of the questions that I asked myself about this cookbook um, were, what was it made of? What was the design? How was it produced? How was it used? Um, what social context could I find clues for it? Um, did it offer clues to time and place? Did I have memories about the objects? I'd, I'd actually never seen it until I unearthed it from my, my family home. Um, were there stories that had convey been conveyed to me? Um, and also, what does having it or possessing it tell us about the person who had it or possessed it? Um, so um, one of the, the things that was really amazing about it, aside from having recipes that tell you about farm life in Indiana during the Depression, all the recipes begin with, um, you know, start with 50 pounds of meat, you know, or, <laughs> or things that you're not typically going to do, or, or, you know, on sausage making day, you know, as though we all do that. So, so from a, a novelist's point of view, it's full of great detail. And if anyone's read Jane Smiley's trilogy, starting with Some Luck, I loved that. It's about an Iowa farm family over a hundred years. And as I was reading it, I sensed that she had come across a treasure trove of material like this because it was so detailed with, you know, how technolo farm technology had changed and how the prices had changed. Um, so it's an invaluable document. Um, so you can just look at it from the point of view of an you know, archaeologist or anthropologist. Um, and here's what, what some of this ephemera that was stuffed inside the, the cookbook told me. And this is from a <clears throat> little piece called The Farmer's Guide Cookbook in the, S, in the collection. My maternal grandmother's 1927 Farmer's Guide Cookbook is more than a book of old recipes. The scraps she pasted and pinned to, because there was no scotch tape, so they were literally pinned in there, and slipped between the pages, home remedies, magazine clippings, shopping lists, poems, a postcard, a program for a piano recital, um, are markers of social identity. 
As an artifact, her cookbook is a window into the practices and politics of a particular time and place and people in American history and a grease-splattered record of her life in Frankfort, Indiana. Among the ephemera I find inside are three different recipes for homemade soap, one with a preamble that seems to date it to the Great Depression. In these days of high prices for what we buy and low prices for what we sell, it behooves us to watch every penny and save what we can. Mm -hmm. There's a poem from 1931. It's the long piece at the, or actually at the bottom. Um, Unchanged by the sentimental and optimistic Edgar A. Guest, also known as the People's Poet. Guest appeared on a weekly Detroit radio show from 1931 to 32 and on television, NBC's A Guest in Your Home in 1951. He was later mocked by Dorothy Parker, who wrote, I'd rather flunk my Wasserman, which is an antibody test for syphilis, um, I'd rather flunk my Wasserman test than read the poetry of Edgar Guest. <laughs> He was, he, was, she, he was also mocked by Lemony Snicket, um, who claims in The Grim Grotto, the 11th book in a series of unfortunate events, every noble reader in the world agrees that Guest was a writer of limited skill who wrote awkward, tedious poetry on hopelessly sentimental topics. <laughs> and yet my grandmother loved Edgar Guest, apparently. Um, so it's a good place, a starting place to, to ponder for anyone who's writing this kind of history or writing a novel based in a, a real time and place. Um, and I started to ponder why I saved things and the role objects play and how people form or reform identity and even how a community creates its identity. <laughs> and then a turning point for me was while, while I was thinking all of these things, is I learned about University of Chicago anthropologist and MacArthur Fellow Shannon Lee Doughty. People always ask me to spell it. It's D-A-W-D-Y. Um, who served as a liaison between FEMA and the Louisiana Division of Archaeology after Hurricane Katrina. She observed that the tasks that she calls the saving community, and I love that phrase, the tasks that the saving community wrestles with <coughs> where and how to dispose of trash and debris and human remains, what actually constitutes refuse and what should be retained as memorial, where and what to rebuild, can be, can't be understood without understanding their entanglement with emotions of loss, grieving, memory, perseverance, and reverence. And so I was reading about Shannon Dottie's work, but also thinking about the President's House in Philadelphia and that repair job um, and my own personal um, reclamation of my history. Um, I was really struck by her use of the phrase, the taphonomy of disaster. And Ben Yagoda, I remember calling you and saying, have you ever heard this phrase? Because you were going to, you were cleaning up after Katrina. Um, I just loved that phrase, taphos meaning burial, nomos meaning law. Um, archaeologists study taphonomic processes in order to determine how plant and animal, including human, remains accumulate and differentially preserve within, the within an archaeological site. But Dottie uses the phrase very specifically as a way of recognizing that after a fire or a flood or a sudden chaotic event, she says, quote, emotions, as much as environmental conditions, politics, and economic forces can shape the archaeological record. Um, and that is a, an idea that I held on to and that shaped some of the essays in this collection, but also the way I was thinking about my own um, process of cleaning out and grieving. It became an organizing metaphor for me, um, thinking about the grief process I was enacting as I cleared my family home of its objects, um, and also for the observational stance I had assumed without really being fully conscious that I'd assumed it. Um, there's a line in the essay, The Pit in the Page, um, which really is an essay about the day that my mother forgot who I was. I knew that day was coming, I was anticipating it, but when it happened, I was unprepared and I felt erased. Um, and yet, as I wrote in the essay, the sad fact is, I'm not really there. I'm still sitting at a table in her art class a month ago, my pen moving across the pages of my journal, beginning this essay. <laughs>
Um, that's what writers do. <laughs> Don't ask a writer to help in a crisis because that's, that's what they're doing. Um, <laughs> let's see. Oh, actually, I want to stay on that one. Um, so, mourning, like writing, I've learned, is labor. Um, putting severed parts together, restoring order from chaos, but its process, as many of you know, um, is internal and its product often invisible. Um, but ever since I was a kid, I've coped with sadness by making things. That's what I like to do. I'm not good at everything I make, as the pie in the middle here will <laughs> show you. Um, um, and so I processed my grief over my father's death by making his favorite rhubarb pie, um, using a recipe from my grandmother's Farmer's Guide cookbook that I had already studied as an artifact. So I brought this as an example. The first example is how you might use an artifact to write history. This example is how an artist might use the same artifact to create fiction or an essay, as I did. Um, I was curious how much of my ancestors' knowledge had passed down to me. The pie making was part ritual and part writing prompt. Um, and my friends know that I'm really good at baking, right? You can attest to that. So the reason this looks so ugly, it was actually delicious, Chris said it was good, um, <laughs> is because I, my rules were I couldn't Google, I couldn't ask questions, I had to follow the recipe as written. And the recipe began with, start with a pie crust. <laughs> Um, and if I could have called my friend Ann Horn, she's really good at that. Um, you always have lard in your fridge, and so did my mom. But it turns out, you know, my years of using the Pillsbury pre-made kind um, did not teach me how to make a pie crust. So my pie crust was, a, you know, I had to guess. Um, the cookbook also didn't give any instructions about temperature or baking time, because you're just supposed to know that, you know, um, because they did this a million times a day. Um, so as I was making this pie with these rules that I'd set for myself, I was taking notes on, you know, what gaps are there between my grandmother and me? What has been lost um, from a, a community of farmers' wives to my mother, who was a blue ribbon 4-H girl, <laughs> to me, um, known as a, as a talented baker but unable to produce <laughs> a decent pie. Um, and I was also reading all these really interesting scholarly articles by anthropologists on recipes as a form of rhetoric. Um, social they, they, they talked about them as social narratives that encourage and enact dialogue between, does this academic language sound some familiar, Teresa? <laughs> like, um, uh, that enact dialogue between the giver and the receiver. And intellectually, I was interested in the idea of a recipe as what they called an unauthorized text, meaning communal, reproduced, improvised, revised, that requires creative interpretation, including modifications, deletions, substitutions, and experiments that enable the cook to reproduce the text in her own way and thereby claim her creative authority. So it's a, a recipe is something that belongs to all of us, not to one of us, but we can put our mark on it. And I was interested in that idea. Um, so I began writing a sort of standard narrative essay that, that went back and forth between the action of making the pie and the reflection about making the pie. And then I just ditched the whole thing because really what I wanted was my father back. <laughs> um, this was a grief ritual and uh, I ended up writing this um, really different um, raw expression of scorched earth despair, which is what I was feeling, um, that is full of, um, you, can, you can see the cookbook I made, um, the essay itself, I, I actually made a cookbook um, and put it in the middle um, with a repeated invocation, let there be pie is the first line, and then it goes on, to echo its source in Genesis, and to sound like a daughter naming and grasping for concrete detail, imagining altered pasts and alternate futures to reorient herself as she writes her way out of the void. Um, and my husband, who's an artist, um, helped me make that cover, which is covered with a copper solution and then corroded with acid, because that's what grief feels like. I wanted a representation of it. Um, and then I put it in um, between covers and I put ephemera in it, like my grandmother's cookbook, so that the, the things that fall out when you pick it up are things that remind me of my father. Because I was trying to make a point about grief not being linear, that it's more like a spiral. You just keep things fall out and remind you and you're right back where you thought you had already gone through that period. Um, 
So it's a visual representation of, of the grief that I was feeling, but also inspired by the very same cookbook that allowed me to think more historically, like a, like a genealogist would. Um, and this is something that, that artists do, especially writers. We work through things by making things. Um, you all know Elizabeth Bishop's One Art, um, the last line, the art of losing's not too hard to master, though it may look like, write it, like disaster. And Virginia Woolf, one of my favorite lines from Moments of Being, it is only by putting it into words that I make it whole. This wholeness means that it has lost its power to hurt me. It gives me, perhaps because by doing so I take away the pain, a great delight to put the severed parts together. Perhaps this is the strongest pleasure known to me. And Alison Bechdel, in um, her wonderful graphic memoir, Fun Home, which was also adapted as an equally brilliant musical, um, shows herself trying to tell the story, her own story and the story of her father who committed suicide um, by drawing panels, which she, she keeps saying in the musical, caption, caption, caption. To me, that resonated the way in, like a, an artifact tag does, where you're trying to pin yourself to the thing that you're trying to, to um, attach to physically. Um, and in the musical, there's a really wonderful song called Maps, if you know it, and I'm not gonna sing it, um, <laughs> but um, the lyrics are, maps show you what is simple and true. Try laying out a bird's eye view. I can draw a circle. His whole life fits inside. Um, and I didn't really notice, but my editor pointed out that every one of my essays has a map in it. Um, I wrote one for the Inquirer for Kevin Ferris uh, about maps, because I went to a really cool map making wor or map workshop at Stenton. Um, but every one of them, including an essay where um, when my mother, st uh, it's called Once More to the Barn, my mother in 2002 was showing symptoms of losing her memory and my whole life she'd been saying, you're a writer, write about me, write about me. Um, and so I said, well actually I'll sit down and show you how to write about yourself. <laughs> so I, I did an exercise with her that I often did with my students um, to, to sort of get them to think outside the box where I had her draw a map of her, the farmhouse that she grew up in in Indiana um, and the way it works is you draw the map and then you draw in more detail a room, then you draw an object in the room, and then you let the object speak. And it sort of disarms you so that you're, you start to think more imaginatively as you're doing it. But my mother, who's a pragmatic Midwesterner, when we got to the object speaking part said, objects don't speak. <laughs> she just thought that was ridiculous. Um, so, so the essay is really about my doing this workshop with her and then writing the essay that she couldn't write. Um, so maps were a big part for me. Um, as I've said, my mother's memory loss haunted me, warning me to make something tangible to account for my life, and yet I was too distracted and distraught during this period to write. So it wasn't just that I, you know, I wanted to, to do a good job as a technician at the archaeology lab, but I also just couldn't write. It was just an upsetting time. And I found that oblique strategies helped. Um, I was just on a panel recently about writing from trauma, um, and I learned a lot from the other artists as well. Um, for me, what worked was studying objects closely, which connected my mind to my senses, and therefore to my body and thereby to my emotions. So whatever I was avoiding thinking about at the lab, the tedious process of washing broken things for seven hours <laughs> tended to have the effect that the material sort of crept in at, at the margins. Um, and also likening grief to ar an archeology span dig allowed me to appreciate the enormity of the process of grief, which many of you understand. Um, when I said it, it will take 10 years to process it all, that was afraid, it re literally, that's how long the processing of these artifacts took, but it reminded me to say grief takes time, be patient with yourself, you know, be, be gentle to yourself, this takes time. Um, but also adopting another profession's vocabulary was a sneaky way that I accessed my own experience without um, having to write about myself. I didn't want to write about this experience um, because it's in some ways was re-traumatizing. So using the language of archeology span allowed me to, to write about other things and then have the emotion come in. The daily practice of recording data on artifact tags, um, paying attention to details, 
made familiar things strange, which is what any writer wants. You want to be able to look at things in a new way and then to try to convey that to the reader. That's what makes writing delightful when it's something you haven't seen before. Um, and then research, which I love doing, and I have friends. Jim Nicholas is one. I found a, an old beer can in my house when um, we were doing renovation, and Jim must have spent six hours with me figuring out over Facebook, figuring out where this thing came from. So you can definitely go down a rabbit hole. Um, but what I love about that is it shows you the complexity of commonplace things. If you look at ordinary objects from your life, you will find interesting stories in them if you're paying attention. Um, and also, I, what working at the archaeology did most of all was to do what every fiction writer needs to do, which is to document things carefully, to write things down, and then to abandon your observations to your imagination. So I think that's what happened between the first use of the artifact of my grandmother's cookbook and then the sort of wild expression of grief that emerged in the essay, which is called From Scratch. Um, so I'm just going to read one piece from the collection. It's a short one called Believers um, because it, it's an example of why um, if you're a writer or if you're the family archivist you should always write things down, um, keep a journal and then keep the journal <laughs> um, because the, I, took some, I wrote this down one day at the lab because it was just interesting to me but I didn't know why and then three years later I finally figured out how to use the material. And I think it's because by that point, I had been at the lab long enough that I felt an affinity with the archaeologists. I felt like one of them, even though I totally wasn't. Like, <laughs> they're really, they're really archaeologists. But I felt defensive on their behalf. And you'll, you'll see why when you hear about the incident that I wrote in my journal that I made into an essay called Believers. And this, um, this is the visual aid. Um, it's a sauce boat, just a gravy boat, you know, used on Thanksgiving, um, made by Bonin and Morris. And this is an example of one that is actually at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. It's a pristine version of what I'm about to talk about, which um, was filthy, missing all of its markings, had been under the ground for a long time and did not look pretty like this. But this is really what, what it was. Believers. The sauce boat showed up in a bag of filthy artifacts dug up at the National Constitution Center site. To my untrained eye, it was just another dirty dish for a volunteer technician like me to wash, label, and catalog. But judging from the buzz in the archaeology lab the day the ceramics collector visited, this piece was important, even precious. The archaeologists believed they'd unearthed a colonial-era treasure, an intact example of Bonin and Morris soft paste porcelain made by the American China Manufactory in the South Wark section of Philadelphia. Corroded and discolored, the sauce boat didn't resemble the company's 19 known surviving pieces. Sauce boats, tiny baskets, pickle dishes, and stands exhibited at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Tests to determine its chemical structure were inconclusive and the underglaze, blue-painted decoration was gone, but the sauce boat was the right shape and bore the right factory mark. If authentic, it was, a, it was historically significant, a souvenir from the campaign to sell locally produced ceramics to colonists, which lasted until Hosiah Wedgwood flooded the market with cheap imported English porcelain in the testy years leading up to the Revolutionary War. But history was only half of it, something else seemed to be at stake. As I inked field specimen numbers onto a seemingly endless pile of pottery sherds, the collector toured the lab. He boasted about valuable acquisitions and revealed his inexperience with mending artifacts to a team of archaeologists who routinely put together shattered vessels like a novelist fits words. His tone and swagger reminded me of an English professor who'd once told me casually, not expecting an argument, that creative work is validated by criticism. Quinn, you know this person. <laughs> as if making meaning wasn't the purpose of writing fiction. As if the point of archaeology was to display objects in a glass case and not to learn about the people who used them. With an exasperated sigh, the collector dismissed treasure seekers who hoped against his expert appraisals that what they'd found in Grandma's attic was worth something. Mm -hmm. Believers, he said. Bingo, I thought. <laughs>
With a word, he'd unmasked himself. Though the archaeologists might never know if the sauce boat was a true Bonin and Morris, uncertainty wouldn't change their work. And yet the collector had discounted these cultural stewards who sift through our soil and process every last seed and bone and bead, who must temper the critics' urge to curate with the creator's habit of curiosity. Believers indeed, artists and archaeologists will spend our lives searching because the process of searching is valuable. Like any object, the sauce boat means something different to every person who encounters it. For the collector, the thing itself is valuable, both for its scarcity and its arcanum, the trade secret recipe for turning coarse elements such as glass and bone and soapstone into fine porcelain. For the archaeologists, the object's importance is partly its provenience, which provides an important context clue. British-born Bonin and Philadelphian Morris were in business for only two years. The manufacturer's narrow production window from 1770 to 1772 helps date the other artifacts found in the same strata on a timeline moving backwards from the contemporary surface to the deep past. For me, the object conjures Thanksgiving not my elegant remake of the holiday, but the dismal childhood version, my family awkward in dress-up clothing, arguing and blasting aerosol cheese onto Ritz crackers while a turkey roasts interminably, filling the house with the sad smell of sage. My family of origin is my pers personal arcanum, an alchemy of resentment and grief that has rendered me smooth and brittle. Memories are my material. Writing is the way I keep myself from shattering. My point is that we value objects or not according to the personal meaning that we bestow. Perhaps it's sacrilegious to say it, but in the months since the sauce boat's discovery, I've often wondered if the pristine Bonin and Morris pickle stand on exhibit at the art museum escaped the privy pit, not because it was treasured, but because it is absurd. <laughs> in life, as in memory, what we don't use is preserved intact. But the archaeological record is often created in crisis, with emotion guiding what we take with us and what we leave behind. I speak from some experience. In six years, I've had to empty four houses full of objects collected by declining parents and parents-in-law, departed parents-in-law, and though Thanksgiving dinner China was abundantly represented, it never once made any siblings must-have list. <laughs> I gave away fancy serving pieces to the goodwill in my hometown. I donated dishes, flatware, and pots and pans to the Nationality Service Center to help furnish the homes of refugees recently arrived in Philadelphia from all over the world. For myself, I claimed items with personal value, my mother's measuring spoon, the wooden doll cradle my father made for me, my mother-in-law's trove of craft supplies. These small forgotten things are like the fingerprints potters leave in the clay, evidence of the maker in what lost family members finished or hope to finish one day. When my beloved mother-in-law died, the apartment seemed even quieter with the noise of unstrung beads clicking together in drawers and fat spools of colorful quilting thread rolling from side to side in wooden trays. There were boxes and boxes of fabric still scented with her drugstore perfume and permeated with the sadness of things left undone. Overwhelmed, I emailed my friend Marta Moretic in London, who quilts as brilliantly as she writes. I knew that Marta, whose own fabric stash she describes as the size of a large, well-fed sow, <laughs> packed in a plaid plastic bag with handles, the kind you see on the news in Asian refugee situations, would know what to do. What would I keep, she responded, in a message I read in the wee hours with relief and gratitude. This is the practical me talking. All pure cottons, all solids, even dull, muddy ones, because they make a useful contrast with brights. Anything geometric, anything really vintage, 
anything seasonal, because even when you don't think you'll ever use a poinsettia print, you find yourself needing one. <laughs> Orange fabrics are oddly useful in many situations, not least at Halloween. Scraps from things she made for you, because you will use them in your own projects and think of her. Fabrics that remind you of her for any reason whatsoever. Green fabrics, because you love green. There should be plenty in the stash, because undoubtedly she knew you loved green too. It was exactly what I needed to hear to get through the heartbreak of breaking ground. As I worked my way through the fabric, I mourned my mother-in-law, but I felt hope, too. The heirloom quilt I planned to piece together from her remnants will be a rare accomplishment given my meager sewing skills. It won't be anything a collector would want, but it will comfort my daughters in incalculable ways long after I am gone. Thank you. And um, I would love to hear questions or if you have things that you thought about while I was talking, reflections about your own ob ordinary objects that have meaning for you. I would love to hear them. Libby, would you excuse me? You have to indulge me here. So we have Avery Rome. We have uh, Kevin Ferris. Is Ben Yagoda here? Yeah, Ben's here. Oh, really? These are, I'm a groupie from the Inquirer. Not from, but for the Inquirer. So welcome to Radnor Memorial Library. This is thrilling. That's all the editors, but then there's all my famous friends. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, any questions? Yeah, Becky. So, yeah. as you get through these things, um, a lot of them filter through your own memory. And did you feel like sometimes you were setting things aside for the next generation, for your daughters? <laughs> and how did you? Feel about that? What did you think about that? Knowing that they they didn't have the same experience It's interesting because um, I'm actually fairly sentimental about things like I still have the Snoopy that I brought to school when I was in first grade you know, <laughs> as a comfort object um, but my daughters don't really collect things they, I mean this generation I think in general doesn't um, so I've had to think about that and I think Allison you're getting tired of hearing me say when I die uh, <laughs> because I have actually made archive boxes I've put um, my juvenilia, my writing, um, anything from Bryn Mawr College, because I've written a lot about the college, and it might be, I've spent a lot of time in archives doing research, so I, I have a sense of what might be useful to a writer or a historian. Um, and I've put it in boxes with labels, and I've told my daughters that everything that's important to me is in those boxes. And it may not be important to them, um, but they don't have to do what I did. They don't have to decide what's important and what's not, because I've done it. I'm still, I'm still doing it. But, it, but I think I wouldn't have thought that way if I hadn't, it, it's more than just cleaning out many houses and you get better at it, um, but it's also just when I was, I had to clean up my childhood home almost by myself. I didn't have any help. Um, and I know Pat, you've been through that too. Um, so I had to have a strategy and I, I really was trying to think like an archeologist, you know, like what's really important and what, what could someone else use now that I, I don't need to hold on to. Um, what's, and as I said, for me, that, that's meaning making. It's what can I write about? What, what is important that I can document? But other things I felt through that strategy that I could get rid of. But posterity for sure is a big part of it. I think what we keep. Um, other things? Jim. I, I found it interesting when you were talking about the cultural change over time and the pie recipe that just says mm -hmm. begin with the pie crust. <laughs> and I found the same thing in, in technical books and technology that a lot of times it's almost like reading a foreign language because they assume you know so much. Yeah. In 1920, everybody knew how steel was riveted. So they didn't talk about it very much. <laughs> you look at it now and what are they talking about? <laughs> because they assume you know these words, they know you know these terms and you know how things are done. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that was that was a real connection. I wonder, looking at how everything has become digitized and how much is stored electronically, will future generations have much of us 
because the media has decayed to the point where it can't be read. Mm -hmm. You can get a 500 year old book and still read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I've got floppy disks that are 10 years old that are unreadable. Mm -hmm. Everything was lost. That's so interesting. I, I know a woman who's a librarian at Harvard and she told me she hasn't handled a book in 20 years. That her, her job is just digital. Um, but she also said um, that if you take a book off the shelf that's 500 years old, it's going to be intact, and most of what she deals with is corrupted data. I can't remember that. There's a really poetic, beautiful term that I can't remember for it. It's another metaphor, but um, but yeah, um, I worry about that too, and I think that's why um, paying attention to these small things and the, the things that might be lost um, is important to me. It's become important to me. Yeah, Cherry. You mentioned the 6,000 books and you salvaged the cookbook. Were there any other of the 6,000? <laughs> I, I started with a stack and then by the end of it, the only thing I took was, um, oh, I'm blanking, the, a year of, oh, It'll come to me in a minute, but I took I took one book other than that, oh. and it was be, it was a book that I could actually read. And I, you know, my books were on her shelves. Friends' books were on her shelves. My, I mean, she read every, you know, she read everything. She was a big reader. Um, I wrote an essay called My Mother's Books. That's how I sa <laughs> that's how I saved it. Um, when I was going to college, she made me a list of all the books that I should have read by that point in my life, <laughs> and, and I actually still have it. And I every now and then go back to it and check things off that I managed to read. Um, but yeah, I, I just couldn't take it, so I I gave things to visiting nurses and you know, donated a lot, but also a used bookstore came and took them off my hands. So. Yeah, were you gonna ask something? Yeah, I was just gonna say, you could all help with this problem of getting things off the computers by giving somebody else your password. <laughs> right, that's so I mean, true. We're all so security-minded that we don't, won't share it with our beloved, <laughs> and uh, when you die, they can't get they in. They can't get in. Right. That's occurred to me many times, and also, um, one of my projects is to put all the addresses of people that I love in a is an actual physical object <laughs> address book because I had to piece that together for my parents to figure out who to invite to funerals and um, and it's painful to do that so it's nice to have a document you know, where it's all written down so I yeah that that's a, a way in which I'm thinking that I it's partly midlife but it's also because I've been through this experience so yeah did your mother have anything in writing like letters or anything like that that uh, you were able to access and, and learn about things you didn't know about? Amazingly, no. I mean, she had a lot of the things that I saved from my mother that, um, that I just put in a file were, she was a real estate broker and she was really proud of her career. She had every business card from every company she'd ever worked for um, and a bunch of resumes, um, things that were part of her business, but she, and she also had date books. That, um, the way that I was able to trace um, her diagnosis was through a date book that showed a blood test and that led me to get power of attorney to get the results of the blood test which she had never shared with me. Um, and it was because it was in a date book um, and which I poured over you know, one of the details in one of the essays is, you know, the heartbreak of seeing a note, you know, she was crossing things out and checking, you know, rechecking things, rewriting things, um, but there was a note saying, call Lib on my birthday. Um, so you find things like that, too, that are, you know, reminders that the person was thinking of you and loved you, and, um, but, but a lot of her, a lot of her ephemera was work-related, because that's just sort of how she was. As I said, she's a pragmatic Midwesterner, like, she was not, um, she wasn't a writer type, <laughs> so. Well, you, you said she read a lot. You know, I find people who typically read a lot also do some writing. Um, uh. But my own personal experience was I discovered uh, about more than 200 letters that were exchanged between my parents. Oh, wow. And um, I'd never seen them before. And they revealed a lot of things, uh, including mm. uh, the fact that some of the stories they told were not true. <laughs> <laughs> There's a story in that, yeah, for sure. That's a treasure trove. Um, I wrote my first novel um, by rereading the letters that I had sent home, and even though my, my parents um, 
didn't, they weren't, my dad was an engineer, he wrote all in caps, you know, he just wasn't, um, he was a very loving, affectionate person, he just wasn't a, a writer, and he was a little self-conscious about his writing, but they saved all my letters, and it was the only way I could go back and access my 17-year-old self, and real, remember that I was an idiot, like, you know, you know in, in retrospect, you think you're like, this you know brilliant person who just had no problems at all and then you read your letters and realize not true so it's good to have that evidence that you can check your own facts against so a good point yeah Leslie I love what you said about the things that fell out of the books that you found yeah every once in a while both my parents have passed away and I'll find something in their handwriting and I just like cherish it yeah um, because like as they declined, their signature changed, or like my yeah. sister started signing the cards for my dad, or whatever. Because he couldn't do it. It's cool to go back and yeah. their actual thoughts in their, in their hand. And sometimes it's just a little emblem like that. I have a little box filled with little things like that. You know, that you don't need the whole photo album. You just need the one iconic photo. Or you just need the one shopping list in your mother's handwriting or that can evoke her. Um, I wish I had her recipe box. Um, I have all these siblings, so like, things went... Um, just, interesting. Just yeah, her handwriting. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Kathy. Libby, I'm, I'm curious, um, since I first met you as a living fiction writer, how this archaeology of home and archaeology of Independence Park, it, how that might be combining in your head for maybe a, a fiction project. If that's a good question. Um, some of what I have been pursuing now. Um, I spent a lot of time in Indiana because I was doing a fellowship and it allowed me to return to my father's hometown, which is Lynn, Indiana, right on the Ohio border, which was a cute little farming town and when he was growing up in the 50s, but um, now it's really depressing and like a hurricane blew through and blew things down and they never rebuilt and the biggest business is a coffin factory that's on the site of my grandfather's farm. Um, so. It, it alienated me, it made me feel sad, and, um, and yet I had this map. My father had drawn me a map um, that said, Lynn, Indiana, all in caps, circa 1950. So when I go, I've been going back to Lynn and interviewing people, really as a grief project, because I was like, what the hell happened to this place? And every time I go back, I meet somebody who becomes a source and a friend, and I've interviewed the town marshal, who's also like the softball coach and the dog catcher, um, <laughs> and also, <laughs> And, you know, the, the woman who runs the library that nobody uses, that's, you know, um, and, and I thought I was going to make nonfiction out of it, but it's also, I, I haven't been able to get back to it, and I, I'm hoping to do that this summer. It, it is also the kind of material, like the cookbook, where a lot of my instinct for being there is wish fulfillment, and sometimes that's the clue for me, that, you know, I want to find out what happened here, but I also just want it to be intact. I want it to be like it was. Um, but it's also an interesting place. It's where Jim Jones um, from the Guyana, Jim Jones grew up there too. Um, so there, there are all these interesting cultural things that I'm trying to examine with a critical eye, not a sentimental eye. Um, that sort of evangelical white culture. My father's um, church was the Church of Nazarene, but it's also, the town was founded by Quakers. Um, so it's a really interesting place. Um, and it could go either way, but I think um, I started out as a nonfiction writer, and I came to fiction, I think, because that's what you could do in graduate school. Um, so this is more what I started out doing. Um, but we'll see. Thank you for asking. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Why don't you tell us what <gasps> Linda! Oh, I didn't see you! <laughs> oh, it's so nice to see you. Maybe I think maybe we're wondering what your, what your vision is going forward. Um, Are you going I, to continue doing the archaeology? I, I should have said, here's Debbie Miller, my supervisor, um, and she left the lab uh, in 2014. That was the year my father died, and that's when I left. Um, I was seven years into a 10-year project, and um, I really loved working with her. And there was part of it was that um, I was, Kat was going to college. It was like a, you know, um, a new period, but also because Debbie was leaving, and that 
was sort of my tie to it. Um, I learned so much from her. Um, the president's house down in the right-hand corner is finished. Anyone can go and see it. Um, so those are the sort of completions of that cycle. And now the, the piece that I talked about from scratch about making the pie is sort of what the, it's a very different essay from anything else in the collection um, because, as I said, it was this raw expression of grief. And that's what opened the door to this new material that I was describing um, that Kathy asked about, um, that that might be my next project. So I'm going to Yado, so I'm super mm, psyched. Oh, you were? I did, yeah. yeah. I'm so psyched. I've applied like for a hundred years <laughs> and now I finally get to go. Beautiful. Yeah. So. Anyway, and one more. Oh, hey, how's it going? Uh, so is this book available for sale? Yes, it's right up here. <laughs> so thank you for asking, Claudia. So thank you so much for coming out. I'll hang around and sign if anyone wants to.